by Vance Granvik, who is a historian and a writer. Um, I will introduce you to Terry in a moment, who will be doing tonight's program. But just to give you a preview, we decided to skip a program in December because there are so many wonderful holiday things that, that people can go to. Um, Roxy, I believe December 5th is when the Barbershop Quartet, yeah. well, it's the Barbershop Chorus. It's a huge group of men, but they sing as a Barbershop Quartet. We'll be here in this spot for a, a holiday concert. So that's December 5th on a Wednesday night. 5.30. 5.30, thank you. So in January, we have something that's called Sail Away on Clearwater Bay on January 9th. And that's um, the historic beginnings and the workings of the Clearwater Community Sailing Center, which is internationally known for a number of things. And it's just across the bridge on Sand Key. You've probably seen it if you've gone across Sand Key at all. So that is in um, January. In February, our own Suzanne Motion, Wave at us, Suzanne, will present the evolution of Clearwater Beach. Um, how is it that we got from the mom and pop hotels to the, the world class destination that they call us at the, these days? And in March, we're going to have the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary here, where America's, they call themselves America's Volunteer Lifesavers. And they have, in 2020, they'll celebrate their 70th year here in Clearwater Bay. And that, that should be fascinating, too, to learn about that. That was in March. And in April, we will learn about the Optimus Pram from a, a man who, as a teenager, first tested those prams, which are the training vehicle for young sailors. And so that, that's Cliff McKay and we're looking forward to him in um, April. So if you signed up on the sign-in sheet and indicated that you would like to be notified about future programs, we'll just send you a reminder. That's the only reason we would want your email, particularly, would be to say, hey, next month there's a program perhaps you'd like to attend. So that's what's coming in the future. I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. That was an oversight. I'm Linda Owens, and I am the president of The Beach Friends. And I told you uh, why we call ourselves The Beach Friends instead of our long, official, state-approved name. So Suzanne is on the board of directors for The Beach Friends. Pat Keith is our membership chairman. And Pat, did you want to say something here? Okay, uh, this is the sign-up sheet for being a beach friend. There is no cost to join our group, uh, so if you're interested, there are forms on the table. Please pick one up. Also, there are free passes that are good until 12:31:18 for the rec center. So, if you would like to try, come and try some of the services at the rec center. You may pick up a free pass, which is also on the table. And the sign-up sheet is going around. The sign-up sheet is basically just for attendance, so we know how many people we have a record of how many people were here. So if you just want to sign your name, you don't have to give us your uh, telephone number or email. As Linda said, if you want to be reminded of programs, please give us your email. Thank you, Pat. And the other one member who is here today is Donna Elias. And Donna, you just kind of wave us. Yes. And we are always happy to have new people join us and help us with our mission of, um, of preserving and um, enhancing our facilities here in any way we can. So just let us know if you're interested in being a part of that. OK, that was our commercial. Now we're ready for the main event here. Uh, Terry Fortner has been kind enough to come to us and talk to us really about her grandmother. This is my personal copy, which I lend out and so far have been fortunate enough to get you back. I know, because these tend to disappear. <laughs> Yesteryear, I lived in Paradise, the story of Kalanisi Island. And it is written by Terry's grandmother. And she will be talking to you about her grandmother's stories and whatever else 
she would like to and showing us pictures along the way. And then I know she has some of uh, Grandma's books for sale back here, which include a cookbook as well. And these would be the memories of the only child that was recorded of ever having been born on Kelly's Island. There may have been some Native American you know, children born there at some time historically in the past, but she's the only recorded child that we know of that was, was born and then raised on Kalanisi Island. And it's a marvelous story. We're so thankful you are here today, Terry, to tell us about it. And I think at this point, it's all yours to enthrall us for a while. Enjoy. Thank you, Linda. The range of friends I know everyone who's involved with the friends uh, does a lot of work that we appreciate keeping this library and recreation center open. I appreciate several friends and that I see in the audience that are here and we're very fortunate because afterwards there's even someone who works on Caledese Island is here. Oh, awesome. So <laughs> after the presentation you can go and check with her, see if I gave any misinformation. <laughs> so I'm going to sit down because I want you to be able to see the slides. Now should we do anything with the lights? to make it a little bit um, you know, dimmer so you can really focus on the photographs. You're going to be seeing actual archival photos of the Caledese Island homestead. So kind of neat that way. It's right here. Yeah, that's what you And yeah. as was mentioned, my grandmother at age 87 could no longer garden and mow her lawn and do all these other tasks at age 87, so she wanted to be useful always, and she thought, well, I'll take time to write my memoir. And she did this really a little bit inspired because she was about to have a great, great grandchild, our daughter Jenny, and she realized she might not be there to see Jenny grow, and thankfully, because he, we would not have known so many of the stories if she had not taken the time. So the moral of this part of the presentation is take the time to write down your memories. It doesn't have to be a book, but if you just write about your life, you will uh, enrich your children and grandchildren because they don't know, they're not listening to us, right? <laughs> But after you're gone, they'll be fascinated to read it and they'll think, why didn't we ask all these questions? And then later, my sister and I uh, did additional uh, memories of Myrtle's life because the, the uh, yesteryear goes to her, is mostly a tribute to her father and her childhood and young adult life on Caledese. But it ends in 1934 with her father's death so we went ahead and wrote the Caledese cookbook to tell more about Myrtle's life. So it has her recipes, but it is also to tell about the rest of her uh, long life. So this is the Dunning Dock, which is located where Bon Appetit is today. And in the distance, you see Caledese Island, and you see um, that people were interested and you can tell by their their um, dress you know their fashions and their dresses that you'll see their um, clothing that they were enjoying the outdoors in florida and that island across two and a half miles across uh, southern uh, across the st joseph sound lying offshore of Dunedin, florida was a destination uh, for picnics and visitors. Uh, a man named Henry Scherer, a Swiss immigrant who was my great-grandfather, arrived in the United States as a young man of 23. He traveled across the continent by foot, horseback, and train, and eventually then came to Florida. He was sort of uh, trying to find, I think, his place and what his livelihood would be. He worked as a farmer and tried some different things and ended up being in Florida. And when he set foot on Caledese Island for the first time, he realized he had found his 
place. Now, I don't know if anyone here has experienced that. Have you ever been somewhere where you felt like, oh my goodness, this, I have some connection. This is my place. It's a cool, it's really special when you have that feeling. And so Henry, he had that feeling about Caladese. This is a photograph that someone made of him in his rowboat, and I'd like to mention, he, he, even when he had his sailboat, he would often row because he enjoyed the physical activity of rowing. Uh, there is uh, something on the stern of the boat. Can you tell what it is? What does it look like? Palm fronds, perhaps? Okay, that was to soften the, the knock of the lead, the lead weights that were on a net. So if you were fishing for mullet and you were letting out your net, it wasn't going bump, bump, bump. It was just, you know, kind of rustling into the water. So it's been fun to look at the photographs and figure out these type of details. Here is Caledese Island, an aerial shot. Goodness, and I just saw we have another ranger here. Yes, sorry, I overlooked you at first. <laughs> you are. Oh. So this is Caledese Island, and the bayou that you see in the lower foreground is now called Sharer's Bayou. And the homestead was located to your right on this peninsula that you see. So realize that the west out in this direction, not, you know, we're, Caledese is that way, and that is basically lying this way offshore from and joined to now part the island that we're on. The Cher homestead was located on that mainland, the side that was toward the mainland, so it was protected from the onslaught of the wind and the weather and the waves. So he had the good sense not to try to build right on the beach. And I don't think I have to say anything else about that. Okay, and now if you look to the lower uh, foreground to the right, you see that canal? That's called uh, Scherer's Pass or Scherer's Canal. And Mr. Scherer did not, did not have to give a permit in those days. He just went ahead and dug through the mangrove and with an axe and a, and a shovel because he was making it so there was a, a slightly quicker pass to get across through to St. Joseph Sound, which is behind us here. So you get over to the mainland to go to Dunedin or to Clearwater. I hope that sort of makes sense, does it? Okay. And here's a a, a map that we got wonderful help from Marcia Colby at um, Bambi, Pinellas County, and she helped us. And we put this in the uh, latest edition of yesteryears to kind of show where the landmarks were for the Sharer homestead. Now, I mentioned that people would come to visit, and that's why we have these photographs. These photographs were not taken by my family. They were taken by the visitors, and I think you might be able to tell from this picture of the house that the visitors were not really coming to visit the house. <laughs> the house was a board and bat and story and a half, you know, simple, rustic, Cottage. Some people might call it a less complimentary name, but it was a solidly built wooden structure that served the family very well. But it was not a thing of beauty, let's just say that. It was beautiful on the inside. <laughs> and here's the um, dock with the pathway going up to that house. The kitchen was built onto the back where you, if a fire started, you knock it off of the main building and save your structure. But fortunately, that never happened. They didn't ever have to do that. So people were visiting, many, many people, because the railroad had been built to Dunedin in 1888. And thereafter, many people from the north 
who had the wherewithal to travel and get away from the cold weather in the winter were drawn to come and visit Florida. And they were just as fascinated by coming here as our tourists of today. And they like to do many of the same things that we like to do. And this is the time of year to start doing them, right? Because it's not so darn hot and the mosquitoes aren't quite as intense. And you can go to the beach and enjoy a picnic or uh, swimming or shelling. And those picnic parties were popular. Now, that was the Malone family that were pictured here. Now, the Malones were very important to my family because this young woman that you see to the left uh, in the black dress, her name is Kate McNally, Catherine McNally. And she works for the Malone family, who are very good friends with Henry. Well, Henry met Kate. And Kate met Henry. And they were smitten with one another. And she had to be kind of a brave girl because she was from Cleveland. Uh, that's kind of a city place, isn't it? <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> and she consented when he got up the courage and asked to become his bride. And their uh, wedding was held in the um, uh, Palm Grove near the homestead. And Kate became Kate McNally Sharer. And even though we have a honeymoon island, theirs was the first honeymoon on Galaxy and, uh, and these islands, which at that time, it was all one island. Calabese and what is now Honeymoon were one island known as Hog Island. And Henry didn't mind that it was Hog Island. That's what everybody called it. But he had friends who were Spanish uh, smack fishermen, they were called, Cuban fishermen. And they would come up from the Cuba and the Caribbean and fish in the Gulf. And they were friends, and he saw on an old map, and I have to say, I tried to verify everything, and I looked and looked, and I have not been able to verify this fact, but it's what I was told. He saw the name Calabese, and he thought that was beautiful. And we think it was Cayo de Desi, because, you know, key, Cayo means key, so it could have been Desi's key, or uh, could have had other, Desi could have had a name, that was a Spanish name. So it's a, it's a little bit of a mystery, but I think in all the world, there's only one Calabese, which is kind of neat, because there's a lot of hog islands. <laughs> oh, and there's the homestead again. This photograph was located in the Malone album that is now in the possession of the Dunning Historical Society. And I was looking and I recognized these pictures, which they would, no one would have known, but I knew where they were taken. And I still have that chair in the family. Someday we'd like to have a place to, to give it to Calabese. But you know, it's pretty cool to still have that chair. So we don't know if this might have been taken on the wedding day. We don't know. But there's Kate in that same, you know, in those days, you didn't have a lot of different dress up clothes. You had one nice dress. And Aunt Cornelia told me about this dress. She was a little girl when my great grandmother Kate was alive. And this older woman who was in her 90s said, that was the most beautiful dress. I guess it was all handmade and lace and such. You can't really tell in the picture, but there's Kate in her dress. And you can also see that the house was taller than you might think. So my grandmother's bedroom was up in the loft. See, there's a, there's room to go in that house, and there's kind of a, a story above there. And here's their marriage certificate. We have these documents because uh, there were cedar boxes, and I still have a few of those, and they were watertight and sort of airtight. And the photographs and the documents were in there, never in air conditioning, never in any type of archival preservation, but kept very well inside of those cedar boxes. 
Uh, we even have when, so, oh, I mentioned, you know, the Homestead Act is very important to know about. Many of our ancestors uh, took advantage of that, and, and I hope in your families you have some of that history. So Henry was able to become a citizen of the United States and then apply for his um, homestead, uh, which was going to be the 160-some acres on Caladese, and he had to build that house, and he had to raise livestock, and he had to have a rifle because that was required. You had to be protecting the land, and you had to also um, plant a garden. And the homestead certificate was eventually uh, honored, and he received it. And it, the original hangs today in the park office at Calabese Island. So when you go there, go see it, signed by Grover Cleveland. I like to put this map in because it shows the boundary. You see that yellow boundary, and then you see the blue line? Okay, the blue line shows the entirety of the land that Henry uh, had as part of his homestead. And then the yellow shows the footprint of where all of his active homestead activities were. There's a real lesson here. They tell us that if we would just preserve one-tenth of the world's resources, we could continue to live on Earth. <laughs> Henry was already preserving like way over nine tenths of his land. He had, I don't know if it was from his Swiss heritage, I don't really know if it was just that he was someone that had that kind of foresight, but he never was interested in knocking down all the trees, building any more buildings. Um, he loved the birds, the plants, started taking people on nature tours, and it was his greatest heart's wish that this land could be preserved. And so one of the most amazing things to me is that it ended up being preserved. And it wasn't really because of anything that my family, my family tried to, my grandmother tried to, to give it to the city of Dunedin, but they wouldn't, they thought it was a ridiculous idea at one time. But ultimately, there were people who saw the value, and so the state of Florida uh, acquired it in 1967. And so thankfully for all of us, and for the quality of life in, in Pinellas County, these uh, state park lands are here. And I thank the rangers who work diligently and with lots of difficulties to take care of beautiful, beautiful uh, lands. So here's the homestead. You see the water cistern. There was only a shallow well, so most of the water was in a rain barrel. And I experienced that growing up in my grandmother's house on Sutherland Bayou. She still had a rain barrel. And there's Henry looking at beehives. So this was one of the things he could do to make some extra money, is uh, raise bees, and he was also doing it as a hobby because he just was, he liked his bees. And then is the time of year when taxes are due, so I think you'd like to see that the taxes for uh, the entirety of uh, Calabese Island was, or, or his homestead was $3.33. <laughs> it was a lot of money, evidently, back in 1899. And then he had a lot on the Hillsborough River, and it's been fun to go and look at that land, too. So the people came to visit, and they took these pictures, and someone thought that Myrtle was a pretty special little child and said, go sit there on the Twisted Oaks. This is on top of one of the uh, Native American mounds on Caladese on Henry's uh, little bit of a nature tour he would take. And they photographed Myrtle as a child. Now, by the time this 
Myrtle was born, Henry and Kate were married in February of 1894. And I hope, no, I'm getting this totally wrong, in April of 1894. And Myrtle was born in February 22nd, Washington's birthday, the following year. And by the time this photograph was taken, sadly, Kate had died. And uh, this is something we all will find as we look back in our family histories as well. Oftentimes, children did not survive, or, or oftentimes uh, there were many tragedies in family. So having a broken family or a uh, losing a parent or children was much more common. I mean, we think it's a problem today, and it is, but they had it for different reasons back then. So Henry chose to keep his daughter living out with him on this rather remote, wasn't, it wasn't remote, but it was removed from the mainland, and in a pioneer time, it was not an easy place necessarily to live, and yet, he loved living there, and about the time that her mother died, uh, Myrtle says in her book, her childhood ended because she became her father's uh, primary helper, and she learned to chop, to chop wood, to handle a boat, to garden, which she loved, to cook at a, at a young age. And this was also at a time in history when many children did learn to do tasks around the house and were helping. So that in itself was not unusual. Uh, but the people who came to visit, and this was a Dr. Badeau who took, who posed uh, Myrtle and Henry for this picture. Now I want to mention, you see Henry's hands? I may mention there's a Cal Easy Memories presentation online and relatives in Switzerland ended up watching it. And in that presentation, I said, see, I have Henry's hands. And when I was a child, I realized I've just got these hands that I can work with, so I'm not embarrassed about them. But my relatives in Switzerland said, oh my gosh, that is a Shearer family trait, these hands. <laughs> so I just thought I'd share that sometimes we have have something that really does come down to us. And I didn't even realize that. So Myrtle said when they took this picture, she had to hold very, very still. So that's why her mouth is like that. They said, you have to hold really still for this picture. Now she was really famous all her life for the fact that she rode her skiff back and forth from Kalanese uh, across St. Joseph's Sound to go to school. And I always thought, well, you know, of course. And Myrtle would say, oh, it was no big deal. People had to walk to school. I just had to row. But, you know, I got out there once on a kind of a slightly choppy day. It wasn't even a big wind. And I'm trying to row my skiff. And I realized when there's a wind against you and there's just a little bit of chop, I see some nods. You get, you know, maybe one oar stroke forward and half an oar stroke pushed back. So she was a strong little child to do that. And here's the Dunedin shoreline back in those days. So that's a charming, beautiful place, isn't it? And we still have some of her report cards and uh, teachers' names and comments. And the teachers were interested. They Several of them came out to visit to see the homestead. Myrtle said that when she was a child, people thought that they might not even live in a house. They just, it was just not a concept. People back, people did not live on islands back then, okay? It was really unusual, and they were thought to be a little bit different because of living on an island. Now everybody wants to live on an island. Um, many people in those days made their living by, um, when the tourists were here, being guides. So Henry, can you recognize him there with his, that's, that's my great-grandfather with the, the suspenders and the little cap. 
and he's uh, taken these fine people out on some type of fishing expedition, and it's probably, he's made a little extra money by doing that. And just like we love to do, people would go to the beach. I'm glad we don't have to get quite as dressed up anymore. And you know, Calabese's Beach is world-renowned, so people recognized it back then. Oh, here's Henry with a, a group of uh, visitors, and they're seated again at one of the Native American mounds, and this would be a place on the nature tour where uh, they would take a pause for photographs, and Henry would tell them a tall tale or two. I think he liked, he had a sense of humor, he told a few stories that sometimes people really believed. There's the Seven Sisters, a landmark, and notice the, the tree behind it. Notice the young lady with her hand on her hip. That came down in the family, too, that would just stand like this. That's my grandma. She's probably like, okay, Dad, one more land, one more, you know, trip through the, the landmarks. Because she's probably done it. So there's the tree. That's what they were there to see. This is where the eagles nested, the height of that nest was 10 feet tall. The eagles would come year after year in September or the last week of August, and I believe they arrived um, back at, now they're nesting at Honeymoon every year, although many times when I visit the homestead, and I wonder what this is about, but one of the eagles will be there up in the pine tree, and I kind of say, <laughs> so it's pretty neat that they, they are still around and able to live there. So Mr. Scherer in those days was also unusual in that he did not allow people to come and shoot the birds on Calabese because it was much more common that people would use their rifles. They thought it was sport to kill you know, all kinds of birds. So he, you know, some people got quite angry with him. He, I've actually met some of the people later that said, you know, your great-grandfather wouldn't let us do this or that on Calabese. So, you know, people didn't, didn't necessarily like him for preventing them from going there. Okay, here's a favorite landmark, the harp tree. You can go to Calabese now and still visit this tree. Has anyone done that? Yes. Very good. Oh, yes, Rosie's got pictures with the harp tree. And that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go to the harp tree and have your, you know, take photographs through the years. Many, many people did that. And it's fascinating to stand with that tree. Let me look at, look at it again. And then when you go to see it, you'll realize, my goodness, some of these pictures were taken 100 years ago, in 1918. And the tree is still there, and basically a little bit bigger around, but you know, this was already quite an old tree. And that, that something that people were fascinated with was what they would grow on Calabese. It was mostly sweet potatoes and greens and you know, Irish potatoes. Uh, there's some strawberries in this garden here and there's some raised beds. Can you see that? During the high spring tide, uh, Myrtle said they would allow the, the, the garden to flood. So that maybe added some minerals to the soil and maybe killed off any you know, pests in the soil. So she was always sort of a, oh yeah, notice, notice a few uh, Australian pines. Guess who, Myrtle went to Miami when she was married and thought that was good to bring one back. Uh -oh. No. <laughs> well, we just did, I see some people who get that because we didn't realize, we didn't know. So they did a lot of farming, a lot of work. Uh, people would visit Mr. Scherer to see the bees, and that's his special beekeeping cap. 
He felt that when he wore that cap, the bees recognized him and the birds recognized him. And guess what? Science is now showing this to be factually true. The research is showing that indeed uh, birds do recognize us as individuals and that bees do feel, uh, can, I mean, they know, okay, this person's okay. So, interesting. Uh, he didn't, Mr. Sheridan did not recommend feeding wildlife, but then what did he do? He had a bird feeder. I guess we all, we all fall to that uh, temptation. He tried to design this. I'm going to have to really look at it sometime. It's supposed to be designed to keep the raccoons out, uh, just like we tried to design to keep the squirrels out. And here's the uh, chickens they raised. And one of the ways that Myrtle um, made extra money was by trapping raccoons. At, in the fall of the, well, it would have been in January. So she was a tough girl, woman, to do this. It was out of a real need to have some actual money. And um, also, the rangers will, let you, will tell us that the raccoons without the natural predators that were once on Kalanese, there were once bears in and bobcat, but they were already gone by the 1800s because think about it, on an island, you could go out there and hunt those things rather easily, and that's what people did. The people had been coming to this coast of Florida for 400 years, uh, so they had killed off anything like that. So the, the raccoons can be a problem, they do need to be kept in check. It's not a happy thought that they do. And yes. I'm sorry, I don't know if we can answer questions, but oh, yes. oh, excuse me. Alligators. Were there ever alligators out there in the brackish waters? I love it that you're asking. There was um, at, did you hear recently, not so many years ago, one of the crop uh, the American crocodiles was found quite close by. Myrtle told me there was an American crocodile in the bayou area back in the day. So yes, the crocodiles, and on occasion, an alligator, but the American crocodile, it does survive quite well in the, in the salt water, and that's its habitat, correct? So does that answer that? <coughs> yep, just another of those things. We just don't realize the things that live around here because we don't really have the perspective for it. There was nobody really documenting it. Uh, there's Myrtle as a young woman, and there's a, maybe the only studio shot that I have of her, and she never showed me this picture while she was alive. You would have thought she would have, right? Yeah. But she did. She had a very humble yeah. opinion of herself, and she did not think of herself at all as being anyone special or beautiful, but I think it shows what, how beautiful she was. And so as a young woman, uh, she was not, she was very content with her life on Kalanese, but she liked to have some adventures, and Henry would um, encourage her to you know, go have, take opportunity. Well, once upon a time, he brought, he brought home visitors often, and in fact, I'm going to let Rosie read something to you in a minute. But one day, she came, he came, Henry came home from town with two young men who were traveling through the area. And of course, they all had a meal together. And I think the young men probably know this Myrtle was an extremely good cook. And then one of the young men kept up a correspondence and eventually proposed via mail. <laughs> The post office, postal service to uh, to Myrtle, and she consented. So she thought she was an old maid at the time. Uh, so she thought, well, I better get married while I can. So she married this gentleman, Herman. But I'm going to let Rosie read an excerpt because this fits in. Thanksgiving is coming, right? So here, can you hold it and read? 
Rose. Hi, everyone. Uh, Thanksgiving guests. Uh, Thanksgiving. I took pride in making a meal. The products coming from what we raised. There was baked chicken, stuffing, sweet potatoes, mashed turnips, <coughs> peas, salad, and pumpkin pie. We usually had several guests who arrived by boat. One year we had not invited anyone and I thought it was just going to be Father and I. When the meal was ready, Father walked in with two very rough looking men. I was surprised. It seemed these two had been camping overnight on the beach and were making their way in a small boat to Tampa. Such a good show of manners I never saw. They scraped and bowed when entering the house and were smiles from ear to ear. I guess I showed my resentment, at least I'm afraid I did. Rather than sit at the table, I attended the table. Coffee cups needed filling fast and piles of hot biscuits disappeared as if by magic. Coffee was poured in saucers and noisily drunk. Food was shoveled in on the blades of knives. My father had a hard time repressing a wide smile as he did, as he knew I did not like crude table manners. Then the men told their story. It turned out they were brothers. They both had farms in Swanee County, but due to a long drought and other disasters common to farmers, there had been no money crops. With farming over until spring, the two brothers had decided to go to Tampa, where they hoped to get employment either on construction jobs or at the dry docks. Not having train fare to spare, they were making the trip in a small open boat that could be sailed or broken. Grown sons had been left at home to look after the women folks. The boys would hunt, fish, and trap to help supply food. And as the brothers said, with two mouths less with two mounts less to feed, it would be easier. They mentioned their trip along the Gulf Coast had not been easy, as there had been headwinds, rain, and cold. Sometimes they had been refused permission to camp overnight and had spent cold, cramped wet nights in their small boat. They remarked that ours had been the only friendly hands extended to them and thanked us to no end. So now, my attitude changed on hearing their story. And as they were leaving, I passed them a box with a half a chicken left from the meal, baked sweet potatoes, a loaf of homemade bread, and a jar of jam. Thank you, little lady. Thank you so much, rang in my ears as they headed for the dock and took off in their boat. Maybe I learned something about Thanksgiving that day. Also, I felt much ashamed of the long face that had put on that was a valuable lesson. I knew it had been a pleasanter day because shared and about this, I felt good. Our meager supper that evening seemed to taste extra good. I appreciate you reading that, and I think that gives you a sense of my grandmother's way of telling and so many of her stories have that gentle little message um, and that's how she learned about life was by living it so there's Myrtle um, I think this photograph was taken in Miami after she was married to Herman in September of 1915 and Herman could do awesome hand stains. <laughs> Herman would also build lots of cabins in his life. And in fact, he built a home that's located right uh, around the corner here from the library because when the development started here in the 20s, they purchased a little lot. And so his house, I've gone by and seen that it's still there. So that's kind of this is my grandfather, Herman. This is a cottage or cabin, I'll say, a cabin that he built in Miami that was their first home. And he was building boats as well. So when this boat was done, they took a shakedown cruise uh, 
down the Miami River, around the Keys, the Florida Keys, and up the west coast of Florida. Now, if there was something I could go back and do, I would like to do that in around that year 1917 and see the wildness and beauty of the Florida of that time. Myrtle uh, cooked along the way, camping. She really was the ultimate, uh, I think, all worldwide champion of the Survivor Series. You, wanted, you were totally, if you were with her, you were in good hands. She knew how to do all of these things. I mean, you can learn a lot from looking at this picture. Notice how she's got the fire set up and then she's got this board in front of her so that she can be right there cooking without getting Know, her knees <laughs> cook so some good hits oh and then always a friend right a friend at her shoulder there so they came back to visit mr sharer at the homestead they tied up at the dock and um, mr sharer said uh, well one thing they knew the houses needed to be the house needed to be repaired so they built Herman built two homes for Mr. Shearer. One's the winter house, and one is the summer house. The winter house has the stove and kitchen in it. So this gave him, uh, you know, a, a secure home. And then he invited them. He said, Mr. Shearer said, now you've been in Miami for a while, living as newlyweds. And they had actually been in St. Pete for a while working. He said, why don't you build and live here because whatever you invest in your building then it's yours and so they did think that was a good idea and they accepted the offer so they built this little another little cabin and which eventually became this house and this is the house where my mother was born and grew up on Calabese and the, the original little house is to your oops I did something to the far um, left. See, there's that. And then look to the far left of this house. And if you go to the homestead, you can kind of figure out um, that that original is where the kitchen was. Uh, they worked as commercial fishermen. My grandmother had a lot of experience with knowing how to operate boats and fishing tackle. And she also uh, grew gardens. And I'm going to skip through the visitors here. But you can see these photographs. They withstood um, hurricanes. She loved animals. And she even you know, raised raccoons as pets when she uh, found that she had accidentally orphaned two baby raccoons. So she took them in and raised them. And she loved when she finally got to have her heart's desire, which was a beautiful horse, to ride on the beach. But much to her surprise, about 13 years, you know, after 12 years of marriage, she discovered that she was going to have a child. It was a real surprise. But I'm glad that she did have one child, because otherwise I wouldn't have gotten to be here. So that's my mother, Marion, and I'm just being aware of the time. Uh, my mother grew up knowing her great grand, her grandfather, my great grandfather, and uh, I grew up knowing Polly, my mother's childhood pet, also a gift from those Cuban fishermen that I mentioned before. Uh, they are the ones who gave Polly to my family. And here's the one photograph we have of the inside of the house. And there's Henry with an airboat. And there he is. He doesn't mind. He's from Switzerland. He just gets right up on the top of those tall ladders. They did that one day, uh, tied the ladders together just to, for the fun of looking up and out over the bayou and the landscape. Mr. Shearer was featured um, in books or magazine articles because people were interested. They had some fantastically interesting people visit them. Uh, Robert Lincoln 
came locally, and he would he came over to visit. Uh, Fritz Chrysler played my great grandfather's violin. That was very exciting. These were people that were able to come. They were staying at the Bellevue Biltmore usually that you heard about last month, and there wasn't a whole lot to do. <laughs> But it seemed like, oh, well, let's go see this interesting man who lives on Calanesia Island. So there he's asked to pose. And you see, when when Robin Williams was still alive, I wanted Robin to play my great-grandfather. And I actually wrote him like three letters and sent him copies of the books, but I don't even know if he ever got them. But you can see Henry's kindness um, reflected in his face. In um, 1934, Henry died, and um, Myrtle was able to care for him on the mainland. By that time, she had moved, she was so chosen to move to the mainland because my mother was six years of age and was going to be starting school. And my mother was not the, the type of child who would have been rowing a boat back and forth. You know, children are different. <laughs> Myrtle was that child. My mother was not. <laughs> Um, Henry and his beloved Kate are side by side in the Clearwater Cemetery. Now I'm just going to show you these other pictures which kind of reflect uh, the rest of the story, but I want to get to this part because our time is coming to a close. And people often ask, you know, how did Caladese get to be a state park? because in the 1930s, uh, Myrtle had attempted to sell for a very little amount her homestead when her father passed, because she knew it was going to be difficult to take care of that land out there. And the, you know, the Dunning City Commission said, no, we have no interest whatsoever in preserving that as a park. So uh, by 1946, she had sold it, but she placed a deed restriction in 1946. And the deed restriction said that that land was never to be developed, it was to be kept as a nature preserve, and that any alterations had to be approved by the Audubon Society and by the local um, Clearwater Marine. It, was, it had a different name then, but it was called the Marine Science Center, and now it's our um, you know, it's our beautiful, beautiful place. CNN. Yeah. Clearwater Marine Aquarium. Thank you. Clearwater Marine Aquarium. I, I kept saying CMA, and I just couldn't come on. <laughs> so uh, that was a remarkable thing to do. Now, I did not learn of this from her. She didn't tell me this. I had to find this out through other sources. But um, she had a very active life and did a lot of things after she moved away from Kalanese, including she was constantly going back over there to visit. But I think the authorship of these books was uh, a great gift that she gave to all of us in Florida because uh, I can say that as a family member, it's valuable, but I've had many, many people tell me the book has uh, worth as an insight into a way of life that we cannot repeat unless we have the experience of reading about it. So it's gone through three editions, and the latest one has a timeline and some additional uh, writing of hurdles. And I was thinking as I was driving over tonight that my next project needs to be, there's other things that she wrote. She wrote uh, An Islander's Year, which is a diary. Of what was happening on Caladese. She wrote um, Pets Through the Years, which is a story of her kinship uh, with different animal friends that she had. So, you know, we love the rangers at Caladese, two of whom are here for honeymoon, but Todd was at Caladese as well. And um, we got to, because of people like you purchasing the book, we got to um, do a site survey and other projects such as this, as this at Caledese, that we, the proceeds from the, my grandmother's book, 
went to pay for this, and it was a project that the, perhaps the state park would not have the funding to do because they're very busy trying to take care of the park. But this is an archaeological site survey that gives a lot of information for someone in the future who wants to maybe learn more about the Florida homestead and how it was with the signage, help with that. And then the Calanese um, chapter of the TAR helped, they financed placing this sign and I got to do the research for it. And believe me, that was an interesting experience. The TAR no longer, I mean, you have to prove every line documented, documented what you put on those signs. So there, you know, you can believe the newer signs very much because they've been really vetted. I hope you get to visit Kalanese uh, Island soon. And I am certainly thankful to uh, my grandmother for the part that she played as a Floridian. And anyone who would like to um, purchase the book tonight, if you're interested in getting a copy of each, I would, there's a presentation special. The book is generally $15 for the cookbook, $20 for Myrtle's book, but together, if you wish a copy of each, $30 tonight. So I thank you for your kind attention. It is 6.30 sharp. I should have left time for questions, but here you go. <laughs> thank you. My understanding, I, I know we have one um, burning question here coming up in just a second from Suzanne, but my understanding is that basically you have like a trust of some kind. Is that you, can you explain once that to here. Thank you. Once upon a time, we had a, a not-for-profit, and I have closed that officially because I needed to, if you had to apply for solicitation, and I wasn't okay. really interested. So if that makes any problem with the library, we can use. The Friends of the Island Park is a not-for-profit. So whenever donations are wished to be made, please steer them to Friends of the Island Park. And that way you can get your tax write-off and, you know, as well deserved. I'm all in favor. Thank you. That's helpful. And yeah, but the, the sale of the book goes to do various projects and keep the book in print. And keeps it in print. So that's where the money goes to the yesteryear book fund. And it keeps the books in print, as you say, and it pays for some of the things that I was showing you there. Okay. Just, just so you had an idea of, of how the finances work with that. Yeah. So Suzanne, you have the first I question. I have a question. You mentioned that your grandfather built a home here on, on Clearwater Beach on um, Bay Esplanade. What's the address? Thank you. That's okay. Fine. Well, I might be able to remember the address if I don't have it in the timeline. I just don't have it off the top of my head. You can see a home that Herman built if you go to 515 Lockley Street in Dunedin. Herman built that home. And I'm sorry that I just don't have that address right. Well, would it be one of the barge homes? <coughs> would he have built it? You know, we have barge homes. You built it actually on the island. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's it's a it's a structured house, and the moment I saw it, I thought, oh yeah, that looks like Herman's house because he had kind of a way that he built them. I can send that information for a few. So that that to be your address, yeah. you've got our and contacts. And then that because that would be because it's fun for you to drive. I think the people living there might be interested to know. Well, they probably they don't. don't. Know. Most of them don't know that they're living in a bar home. So yeah, okay. yeah, okay, great. Yeah, that's interesting. And other questions? Was that your question? Okay, yes, go ahead. What municipality is uh, claims that they own the Dunedin or Clearwater? Back in the day, Clearwater, the Kalanese Island, do you know what happened? It was almost embarrassing because the city of Dunedin was applying to make it a state park when they realized we don't own it. It's not in our, you know, it's not in our city 
<laughs> so they had to rush around and do something to make honey move and Calabese part. I mean, how long did it take a few from there to the school? It definitely took an hour and a half, an hour to an hour and a half, and that was on a good day. On each way? Yes. To yes. row from home to I mean, if I you had the wind behind you, maybe you could make it 30, 40 minutes, but it was very rare that that would happen. You know, you know what happens when you're rowing in the morning towards the mainland? The wind's coming this way. And then when you're rowing back out, the wind's coming that way. Anyone else? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Are any of those structures still standing? Good question. The, are any of the structures still standing? No. You know what happens when structures are vacant? People come and vandalize and burn them down. So that's what happened to all the structures. But the foundations are there. Where's that park? It's on the trail at Caladese Island. So if you go to Caladese, Kind of, it's kind of at the heart of Caledonia. I think I have a map in my book, and I think it might show on the map. Yeah, I have a Caledonia Island State Park map in my copy, so it might be on there, which you can look at if you like. Anyone else? I'll be right over there, and I thank you, each and every one, for being here tonight. Yes. Okay, well, she wasn't rowing to the ranger station. She was rowing to the bayou on, and tying up at that dock that you saw in the picture and just walking up the pathway to the house. That's a good visualization. So that canal that, her, that Henry dug, he, he dug that so that, you know, you were rowing to the bayou and then you come back to that canal a big map, but you can visualize it if you look on a map. Yes. And there's the cheap road to like where Old and Petite is now? Is that where she would go? Pretty close to there, yes. It was to the Malone family dock, and she would tie up her skiff, and then you know you don't leave your keys in the car, right? <laughs> you put your oars on your shoulder, and you take them, and you stow them away somewhere, because if you left them in your skiff, they might not come back to the skiff, so things were not that different. Than this now. Although probably the difference would be in those days, if somebody took your skip, somebody knew who it was. Because yes, <laughs> <true. laughs> you, you didn't know everybody in town it was what they were up to. She went to school in the Yes, she did at the corner of Highland and Main Street. It's you know it's not that far from the quite away. It is still a long way. Yeah. Yeah, but see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those were the days, right? You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much.